A lot of folks have commented on FrameFlex videos that I've recently made. One of the videos that I made here at my property and then several videos that I've made and I'm still featuring on uh, my trip or from my trip to Elkhart, Indiana to meet the folks over at Lippert. So I'm going to try to be 100% transparent here and answer your questions. So the first question, it's actually a question a lot of folks asked, at least a lot of folks that probably didn't care for the video segment I did out there regarding FrameFlex. A lot of folks said, are you sponsored? Do you have any type of financial uh, reliability, or, sorry, financial dependency? That's probably the better way of saying it. Um, with Lippert? Do they, do they pay you? Uh, the short answer to that is no, they don't. They are not a channel sponsor of mine. They have provided me some accessories, low cost stuff, nothing super, super expensive, thing, things like door accessories, stuff that clips onto doors. And if they haven't provided it to me, my official channel sponsor, eTrailer.com has, because eTrailer, as well as just about every automotive retailer in the country sells Lippert products, either under the Kurt brand or under several other brands that they own. So if you're going to review a Kurt Hitch, for instance, it's you know owned by Lippert, so it's a Lippert product. The That division is specifically for like aftermarket parts though. So it has nothing to do with like their frame, their chassis, but a lot of folks are going to be like, well, if they sent you a screen door protector, if they sent you something for your door, or a ladder, you've obviously, you know, caved into Lippert and now you are beholden to them. And that's totally not true. Anytime a YouTuber, most of them, I'm going to say the credible ones, review a product that was provided to them, it's usually under the very, very strict guidelines that I'm reviewing this product for evaluation and to provide credible feedback on. So, I've done that plenty of times. When there's a product that I don't care for, I tell you guys. I tell you what I don't like about it, the part that might be troublesome, the part that's hard to install. And I think those of you who watch most of my videos would probably agree with that. There's a few people who probably just came to my channel after a long vacation from it because of the frame flex stuff. But if you're a longtime supporter of my channel or follower of my channel, you know that I am very, very honest about my opinions related to everything RVing. And a lot of these are my opinions, though, right? It's an opinionated channel. But, yes, Lippert, as well as Moride, as well as a lot of companies, actually, provide, like B&W. But B&W, I've been working through e-trailer, so I don't get anything directly from them. But it's to review products. So, just something to keep in mind. It's, this is one of those scenarios where people are like, you know, are you bought and paid for by this company? I'm not. And... You know, when it came to the frame flex stuff, the only financial aspect of this, which I required as part of this, was that they would pay for my flight and my hotel when I got there. That was it. I did not expect them to do anything else. Um, when they booked all that, because it had to go through their corporate travel company, when I booked all that, they also got me a rental car. So the means to get there so I could sit in front of them was dealt with by them. They took care of it. It was done through, again, their corporate travel partner, which makes a lot of sense. And if you've worked for any large corporation, you know that that's typically how it's done. Mainly because, quite frankly, I don't know how videos are going to perform. I don't know what financially is going to come from YouTube, because YouTube, for a lot of folks, is, has definitely been a burden over the last couple of years. It is not the growth engine that it used to be two to three years back. And that's every YouTube channel, at least every larger YouTube channel. They're all kind of struggling with this right now. This is not exclusive to me and it's not exclusive to trucks or RVs. This is something a lot of folks are dealing with. Even some of my good friends that have millions and millions and millions of viewers, we message each other, we talk about it, and everyone's kind of struggling right now with the YouTube algorithm because they're really trying to drive people towards short format content and kind of away from the traditional longer content. Um, a channel that I love, Berm Peak, if you're into mountain biking, go check it out. Seth has an absolutely fantastic channel and he's made a series of videos talking about this and he's got millions of followers and he's struggling with the same thing that I am and a lot of other content creators. I don't know if it's hitting the folks with smaller channels, but it is certainly hitting folks that have, have larger channels. So a lot of folks are saying, okay, so, are you bought and paid for? Are you sponsored by any RV manufacturer? No, I'm not. Uh, Winnebago, none of those companies sponsor me. None of those companies funnel money through me in any way. Uh, no RV manufacturer or component manufacturer is sponsoring my channel. 
So Coachman in the past has helped fly me up to their facility when we were doing the collaboration with the Coachman Brookstone. When we were kind of talking about what it was going to be, this was that deep collaboration where I helped design the floor plan. So Coachman paid for my travel up there. There was no extra money for that. And then they also paid to bring me to the Elkhart dealer show, not this year, but the year before. And that was really nice of them. I appreciate that. Again, things that can get really, really expensive, they, that helps out. And there was no understanding that I'm going to talk good about their product. It was simply to go to their section and review multiple units that they had out there. That's all it was. And it's always my discretion what I say about them. It's always, there's never any points of you need to say this or you should say this. They let me tour the units, get my own personal opinion of them. And then if you go back and watch those videos, we might talk about some of the advantages like Asdell on the outside and on the inside, things that people want to know, upgraded suspension, upgraded tires, three air conditioning units. We talk about things like that, but I talk about that on any unit that I'm filming. Whenever Coachman, you know, allows me to film as many of these units as possible, they always like to say, well, these are what we've done different for 2023 or 2024. So that's kind of the extent there. Surveyor, I also have been doing collaborations with. So this is a deep collaboration with them as well. Part of this is that I'm going to help them actually design a floor plan. And I've always been a fan of Surveyor. So it's, it's not a bad thing. Uh, this allows me to also do some things that I haven't been able to do in the past, like tow vehicles or tow with vehicles that a lot of folks have been inquiring about, like half-ton trucks. Um, and that's been a really important thing for me as well. That was the main goal here. As you've seen, we've done a lot of upgrades and changes to it. And I've made several videos about things that I suggest should be improved, things that should be upgraded. So you can't watch this video and be like, man, all he's ever said about this thing are good things. And if you go back and watch my videos, you'll see that about any content that I put out there. And I can collaborate with them for the development of a new floor plan. And that was probably the single most important thing to me as a content creator. Creator. boy, having an RV manufacturer actually say, hey, come in, help us design a floor plan that people might actually buy on a dealership lot, that's like, that's awesome. It just feels good. It feels good to know that you have some influence in that area. So I hope that that answers the financial aspects of things. I'm trying to be very transparent again about this. So again, let's move on to the next one. The next one is RV Frame Flex. Let's focus on that here for a second. Do I believe that the consumer, the person who buys the RV, whether it's new, whether it's pre-owned, whatever, do I believe that they are at fault for what's happening to the RV frames, what's happening to the body? Do I believe that? Not in all the cases, not even in probably half the cases. I don't know. I can't tell you who's at fault, who isn't at fault. So I can't say that without deep inspecting and truly like tearing something apart and diving deeper into it and probably not even having enough knowledge of the entire structure to know who's ultimately at fault. I can't say anybody's at fault. I can't say the consumer's at fault. I can't say the RV manufacturer is at fault. And I can't say the frame manufacturer's at fault until you tear everything apart and you see specifically what's happening, what's happened, you can't make those claims. It's just not, it's irresponsible to. You have to really dive into a unit, investigate it, and see what is going on. And if it is a problem with the frame, if it's proven to be a frame issue, the frame was too weak in a certain area, the frame did not do what it was designed to do, or the frame needs to be improved to better do what it's designed to do, then it's totally the frame manufacturer's fault. But I can't make that claim. It could be a deficiency with the frame, who manufactured it, maybe one of the 600 plus welders that are welding frames in just one of their factories. It could be. It absolutely could be. I don't know because I'm not a welder, first of all. Of all, I don't know if an ugly weld but a solid weld is as good as a pretty weld that's solid. I don't know the answers to those questions. Only the welders who will inevitably, you know, chime in on this video know the answers to those questions. I've seen a lot of super ugly welds on very structural things and I don't see them fail. But then I've seen a lot of really pretty welds and it doesn't fail at the weld, it fails somewhere else next to the weld. So I don't know the answer to that question. All I know is that the, let's just call it a collaboration, the segment with Lippert was designed to provide some level of education in a way that most folks could digest. 
Where's the problem coming from? What potentially could be causing the problem? Is it the RV manufacturer's problem with how they attach things? Is it Lippert's problem with how things are designed to be attached to? Is it the consumer, the owner's problem because water damage, frame damage, structural damage, where I towed this thing, what I loaded in it? I mean, I don't know. The videos were not meant to place blame. The videos were meant to be educational videos just to explain what's actually happening or what could be happening. Now, folks are going to say, are you going to reach out to the RV manufacturers to get their opinions? Now, believe it or not, I've had several RV manufacturers that have reached out to me after those segments, none of which is the brand name that you're probably thinking, which is Grand Design. But some others have reached out to me just to kind of wonder, you know what, if if we, we speak about this and we want to get ahead of this, um, do you feel, based on what you've seen with our product or based on what I'm telling you we do with our product, that that it's doing okay, that it will do okay because we haven't heard any complaints that we're having these problems. And I said, I can't instruct you to do that. All I could tell you to do is just share with people what you're doing. If it's different and better, share it. That's how you build confidence with folks. If you think your process of attachment is better, if you think the materials you use is better, if you think your structure is better, brag about it, share it, explain why, show videos on the production line letting people know why you think your process is truly better and let them make the informed decision on if it is and even take that feedback and and make improvements if you think you need to make improvements. But that's the advice I've been giving any of the RV manufacturers who have reached out to me. And some of these are brands that are already known to build high quality units. And believe it or not, I think the ones that already have that perception behind them, a few of those are the ones that have actually reached out to me because perception to them is what matters because perception is reality. If it's your perception that something's built well, that's your reality. If it's your perception that something's built poorly, that's your reality. So the answer to the question here is, The videos at Lippert were never intended to be a finger-pointing issue. Now, if you came away from those videos believing that that's what was happening the whole time, and you truly think that it's us saying that you are the one that's wrong or us pointing fingers at everyone else, um, I, you know, I'm going to say that anytime you meet with a major corporation... Lippert is not a small mom and pop company. It is a huge company. It's got over 10,000 employees. It's got like 140 facilities. It's it's worth billions. It's not some tiny mom and pop organization that's just trying to protect its little its little self. They are being careful about what they say because like any large corporation, small comments, things that might be just misinterpreted can turn into big things that potentially can cause problems. Let me give you an example. Eric, who was the engineer in both the first, second, and even the third video, said when I asked him in the second video, first question, do you get your steel from U.S. manufacturers? That was a simple question. I even made point to that in the video, that it's a simple question, should have a simple answer. He goes, yes, but then he kind of stumbled with what he said, and he goes, well, I believe so, something like that. Maybe we get an outrigger from, you know, somewhere else, but I don't think so. Well, we confirmed later, he confirmed later that it's all U.S. steel, the whole thing. None of it's outsourced. None of it goes to anybody else. It's SDI or Nucor. And most of the steel is actually relatively close to them. And I saw the steel. It's all stamped SDI US, at least in the frame portion of it. And the reality behind this is that little slip up with when he said, "I, I, I believe so. I think so. We might get an outrigger from here. People grasped onto that as if it was some big conspiracy, like he did not know the answer. Have you ever, and I'm just asking, have you ever been in the hot seat to where somebody's asking you questions on camera and you can't slip up at all? Yes, we can cut. We can go back and re-ask the question again, but we didn't want to do way too much of that because there were a lot of edits because, believe it or not, a lot of people aren't super comfortable when they're being asked questions about a serious topic and they have to be careful how they answer those questions. Again, that little piece that he said, I believe so, we might get an outrigger here, and then he, he kind of said, but yes, everything else is steel, or everything else is U.S. manufactured steel. People grasped onto that, and they're like, he needs to know the answer to that. He didn't know the answer to that. He just didn't say it right in that video. Now, again, in this, this segment, a lot of folks want to know, were these questions pre-prepared? Well, believe it or not, these questions were the questions that you all asked 
They were the questions that, that you as the viewer of the channel posted. So when you say, did I submit my questions to them ahead of time? I didn't even have to. They knew. They went to the actual community section and saw the questions that people wanted to know the answer to. Why on earth would they want me to then submit the same list of questions when they already had them? So did they have time to prepare? Of course they did. Just like you, the viewer who submitted the questions, had time to think of the question. They All they had to do was go to the community section to see the questions. And yes, they wanted to vet some of the questions just to make sure that the answer that they gave was an answer that wouldn't have confusion around it, kind of like the steel answer. Kind of one that people will grasp onto and say, wow, what did he just say there? Let's pause it, rewind it, and look at his body language, his positioning. How did he answer that question? They wanted to go into this interview prepared as any executive vice president of any company would expect to. So here's something to think about. If you own a Ford truck, right, a Ford truck, and it gives you problems. A lot of people say, you know what, I have a six liter power stroke diesel from, you know, 2010 or, or sorry, 2005 or six, whatever. And it gave me all these problems. Who did you complain to? You went to the dealership. You might've yelled at them. You went to perhaps the online forums. You submitted emails. You called Ford customer service. You vented on all of them. Did any of you, now I can't really say that because I'm sure somebody out there was able to, did any of you have an interview with a senior vice president of Ford to address the power stroke issue to where you could sit down and ask them questions? Do you wish you could have? They provided me access to folks that the normal consumer would never be able to get in front of. And they did it at great risk. This is not something that is easy for a company like this to do. They've never done it before in their history. And they allowed me to ask questions that you all submitted in the hopes of being able to add clarification, at least from their perspective, on what they thought was happening. Now, in those videos, were they softball questions? I don't think the questions were softball. I don't think any of my questions were softball questions. They were legitimate. Why is FrameFlex occurring? What are you guys doing with the manufacturer to help deal with it? Again, questions from you all. These weren't questions that I just made up. I even asked some really difficult questions like, can the storage compartment of your RV hold the entire cargo capacity? These are questions people wanted to know, and that actually ended up being a customer question as well, or a viewer question. I asked questions related to pin boxes. I asked questions related to where it's happening and why it's happening. The answers they gave were certainly prepared answers. Again, they had full access to the questions because I posted them on my community for, I mean, people posted them and shared them on my community board. So yes, people asked questions. All they had to do was go look at it and they knew the types of questions that were gonna be asked. So they were prepared. They were cautious with how they answered the questions again, because think about, like I said, the US steel question and how that was answered with a slight hesitation and everyone pounced on it and said, he's hiding something, he's covering something up. It's Chinese steel when we've confirmed that it's not. So. You have to be careful, and from a corporate perspective, that employs a lot of people, that has a lot of contracts, a lot of obligations, a lot of relationships. It has, you have to be careful. You have to. It's just common sense. And if you, if you think that any other YouTuber who covers RV information can just go in there, they're going to bust the door open, and they're going to be like, you need to answer these questions. Well, if that's how they'd approach it, they'd probably be drug out by the security and, and, and hauled off by the police, or they would just never have had any access at all. I wanted to provide you some level of visibility and some level of context to some of this stuff that, that I don't think a lot of people realize is never given. This information is just never typically shared on YouTube. You don't, you don't hear manufacturers that, that are willing to sit and talk about this stuff. So they talked about it. So I got to give them thumbs up for that. From my perspective, you know, some people have mentioned some other YouTubers who they said if, if this person was here, she would have asked them the questions that we needed answer, answered and demanded answers to those questions. Well, I don't believe she would have. I believe she might have tried or she would tell them, well, I'm going to ask you questions. I'm going to demand an answer. And then that's as far as it would have gone. She never would have gotten the interview. 
never would have sat in there. And because of that aggressive approach that a lot of people want, you'd never see like the frame factory. You'd never see the, the, the plant where all the beams come in. You'd never see some of the innovation that they're trying to develop. You'd never see the improvements and advancements people are asking about. You'd never see that because she never would have gotten far enough communicating with them to ever justify a trip to Elkhart, Indiana or Indiana period to see any of this stuff. This is a major corporation we're talking about. You don't kick doors down and demand information from them because they're not going to do it. They're not going to give it to you in that way. So I felt with the opportunity that was given to me based on them saying, sure, we'll sit down. You are relatively technical in the RV space. You have tried to show an unbiased approach to the, the construction of the RV, never saying it's perfect, never saying that nobody's at fault from the manufacturing side, while at the same time also explaining some of the things that can happen when you tow an RV and load it up. Because before my video with Lippert, I made videos talking about that. I've always been focused on towing safety. I always have. And for those of you who are like, well, then why aren't you going after them harder? Because the resolution to me in a lot of ways is something that has to come from everybody. It has to be consumers knowing the weight. It has to be consumers knowing where to put that weight. It has to be manufacturers knowing how to attach things, how to build things. It has to be the frame manufacturer knowing how to constantly innovate and evolve to address things, such as heavier-duty tow vehicles that have 1,200 pound-feet of torque that are pulling so much more leverage on the front section when they take off from intersections because they're, they're just that powerful, far more powerful than they've ever been. A viewer actually left a comment in my on one of the videos saying, have we even thought about that? And I didn't think about that until he mentioned it. So big shout out to the viewer. I don't remember who you are, but he said, you know, have we ever thought about the fact that 15 years ago, trucks had like 250 horsepower and 500 pound feet of torque. And now they have, you know, 600, 500 horsepower and 1200 pound feet of torque. Imagine the type of strain now that the, the, that much power can put on the frame whenever you're accelerating with it. And I, I didn't think about that. You know, these are all really good points. But again, the fact is, right off the bat, for those of you who are like, you didn't defend the consumer well in those videos, you should have gone in there and said, why are your frames failing? Why are they cracking right here? Why do you have horrible welds? Why do you have this? I mean, all these things that don't exist on every unit, but might exist on certain folks' units. And then we have to go in there and, and quantify, well, is a bad weld that is still holding but ugly so structurally you know, poor to the overall structure of the home that that's the reason why something failed, right? And a lot of folks are going to say, well, you should have reached out to, you should have reached out to these YouTubers that are having the problem. I tried to. I'm not going to mention names because I'm not going to go there, but I tried to reach out to three of the the larger channels who have really put a lot of time talking about this, really put a lot of energy behind it, and really tried to express what's going on and the challenges they've had, I reached out to them a week before I flew up to Indiana, before I even knew I was flying up to Indiana to get kind of an interview to find out what was going on, what happened, explain it to me. I'd love to know from a technical perspective because I'm not dealing with it on my fifth wheel and I'd love to know what you're going through, where you think the, you know, the failure was, what you think caused it. And do you want to know how many of them actually replied back to me? I emailed where there was an email address and I commented where there was, you know, a video that I could comment on. And um, in some cases, my comments disappeared because I would email first, and when I wouldn't hear back, I would then comment saying, I emailed you, could you please check it out? On one of the channels, the comment disappeared. I don't know what's going on there, I don't know why, but my comment disappeared, and I have yet to receive an email correspondence back from that YouTube channel, which is arguably the loudest in this space. I would love to talk to those owners to find out what specifically is taking place with their unit. And I haven't had a chance to do that. Um, let's talk about some other things. So a lot of people think, well, I'm a shill for the RV industry. Well, I don't think so. Why? Because a lot of folks RV, a lot of folks have absolutely no problems RVing. A lot of folks have no problems doing little repairs, little things that they know are gonna happen to their RV through ownership. A lot of folks RV and have problems, right? A lot of folks tow, they have delamination, they have frame flex, they have, uh, trim cabinets that fall apart, they have plumbing issues, they have electrical issues, they have all sorts of things like that. But when I talk about RVing, I never focus in on trying to say this problem that this one person's having 
or how good this other person's RVing experience is should reflect what everyone's going through. That's irresponsible. It's not, it's not smart. If somebody says, well, I have a Surveyor Legend and boy, it was shoddy quality. It wasn't built good at all. Well, there's always another person that's going to say, man, it's great. We've never had a problem. And if it was, it was minor and we fixed it. There's two sides always. And again, it's irresponsible for me just to bash a product without any knowledge of what everyone's going through with those products. So to say that every RV out there is dealing with frame flex, it, they're not. But I know a lot of people are suffering with it. I truly do. And I know that a lot of people are, are upset and they're passionate and they're wanting real answers. They're wanting to know what's actually happening, why it's happening, and who is going to fix it. Is the manufacturer going to fix it? Is the frame manufacturer going to fix it? Is the insurance company going to fix it? Where do they go? And I sure know if it was happening to me, because we have a large fifth wheel over 17,000 pounds. I have a lot of weight up here. Owning generator, washer and dryer, big upgraded mattress. Uh, I have three AC units on the roof. I have solar up here. I have, or three panels up here. I have two huge batteries, big inverter, and a lot of stuff in here. Got a lot of stuff. And do I feel as if my frame is going to last? Do I feel if it's going to fail? I don't know. I'm not a full-timer. We don't tow nearly as much as a lot of you all do. We don't live in it. And we probably will never deal with it, quite frankly. It's just, it's probably just something through just the sheer number of trips we go on versus somebody else that will probably never experience it. But if we do, I'll sure as heck share it with you. I'll share my journey with you. I'll share what we're going through, if it's a positive experience or not. And as a lot of people are going to say, well, of course, it's going to be a positive experience because you're big truck, big RV. And that could be true. Uh, you can't hide that very much, right? I could take it to a dealership and just say, try to fix it. But they could find out. They could pretty easily find out if this is big truck, big RV, and they're going to do something different. I can't, I can't stop that from happening. I can't, right? So they might know, well, this could appear on a video. So I need to, I need to do the best possible job, or we need to do the best possible job. Um, all I can do is document what happens. I can document the problem what I think is happening, how it's occurring. I can document the resolution, how it's fixed, what they did. I could even tell you if I think they're doing it because I have a YouTube channel. I don't know, but these are all things that I can do. And I can almost guarantee any of you, if you are documenting what's going on, you have more power than not documenting it. If you're taking video and you're showing it, you have more power there, especially on a hot topic like FrameFlex. There's folks who have no subscribers. They throw a video up and all of a sudden they have 150 subscribers and 20,000 views on a video because they just mentioned FrameFlex in the video. So use the power of that to get your message out if you don't think you're being taken care of by a manufacturer. Now, I talked also about used units, pre-owned units, and how I'm blaming everybody with a pre-owned unit for, or that's what people are saying, I'm blaming them for having a pre-owned unit, and that's the reason why, why manufacturers are shutting them out and not dealing with them. Not because I'm blaming them, but because it's a pre-owned unit. Well, in some cases, some of the comments, people are like, I have a 16-year-old unit that I have frame detachment. I have some type of an issue up front. I, guys, seriously, how can I comment on that? What can I say? I don't know what in the world. In this one case, it was a 16-year-old unit that was purchased pre-owned. I mean, seriously, think about it. As much as people want to step up and say, you know what, whoever built that frame, because I don't even know at that point if it was Lippert, whoever built that frame should step up and fix it for him for free. I mean, really, I don't, I don't, I don't understand that mentality. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm not understanding something correctly. But there were a lot of cases where I have a seven-year-old unit or a five-year-old unit and I just want them to fix it. And I'm like, I get it. I totally do. I would want the same thing. Trust me, I deal with that with my truck. But if it's not in warranty anymore, and even if it's a month out of warranty on your vehicle, most of the time they're not going to help you. And I'll give you an example of that in a second. But that's just another thing to understand is that once it's out of warranty, it, it, it's, it's, man, it is significantly more difficult to get a problem fixed. We all know that from an RV manufacturer, from an automotive manufacturer, from a gooseneck trailer manufacturer, from a generator company, from shoot, a, a company that makes a watch. It's, it's very difficult. And for those of you who have older units, when I say older, like four and a half, five years plus, 
I, I can't comment on it. I can't. It, it's irresponsible. It just makes no sense for me to comment on a pre-owned unit that has had so many miles, so much, so much life on it, or possibly even if it sat in its uh, RV, you know, parking lot princess. You know, if if water's gotten in in a couple cases, I think there was a video on that where water got in, it got underneath the failing up here, and everything was rusted out, and there was all sorts of issues up front. Well, I don't, I don't know who to point a finger at for that. Do you point a finger at the manufacturer because their frame should have been able to withstand water for years and years and years collecting on it? Do you point it at the the frame manufacturer? For some reason, do you point it at the roof manufacturer for, because the seal wasn't right? Do you point it at the owner? Who do you point the blame at, right? And that that's another point that I'm trying to get out here is that Oftentimes, it's difficult to place blame. We all want to place blame and have someone to yell at. And it's really easy to say that the RV manufacturer, who we all know in this industry, there's a lot of companies that build pretty poor quality units. We know this. This is not something that's new. Um, a lot of companies have a perception of building a better quality unit. But does that mean that they're still not susceptible to problems. They're still not susceptible to maybe maybe a poor design here or there, whether it's the frame manufacturer, whether it's the RV box manufacturer. There's always chances of problems. And yeah, let's go back to the welders. There's a lot of welders that watch my channel, obviously, and there's a lot of welders that, that look at welds and they're like, who did they hire? Do they even have a training program and all this stuff? And, and I get that there are some phenomenal welders out there. I've featured some on my channel, some who are just really, really good, including a technician from Lippert who came out and did some bumper work on the back of the RV right there. And, and you know, they're good. They're good at their craft. And then there are some welders who just aren't as good, maybe just through lack of experience. They haven't done it long enough. Maybe they got hired, they're learning, they're perfecting their craft over a long time, or maybe they're just having a bad day. Maybe they're just they're just having a migraine headache that day, or maybe something's just not working well with them. I think we all have bad days occasionally. But when you're working for a frame manufacturing company or an RV manufacturer, because there's a lot of welding that also takes place there as well when you're talking about the upper deck, the aluminum attachments and all that, it's not right, right? If there's a problem with a weld and that weld is the reason why something failed or isn't working anymore, and that weld is not being asked to do more than it's designed to. That's probably the best thing to preface it with. If the weld is well within the specifications to do from an engineering aspect, what it was designed to do, where it was designed to do it, under the loads that it was designed, if it fails, then yeah, that's a manufacturing issue, right? If it fails because nothing broke but that weld, then that's a manufacturing issue. Right, just right off the bat. I'm not gonna say, at least in my opinion. I don't know what other people might say, but here's the deal. You know, visiting Lippert, they have over 600 welders in just one of their factories. Do we honestly think if you went to a restaurant that served 600 burgers, that every 600 burger is gonna taste identical and be identical, even if the same chef makes all of them? Probably not. Now, over a period of 600, he might perfect it. But the reality here is if I have 600 chefs making 600 burgers, you know, there's probably prone to be a couple of them that just aren't that great. And when you have that many people welding that many frames, some of them who are still probably learning to improve their craft, you know, there's always a chance that you're going to have some product that's not ideal. And that's just with anything that's manufactured. It doesn't have to be the frame. So, for me to just go in and, and shoot down welds, I can't because some of the welders there may be the absolute best welders you've ever seen. And some of the welders there may be kind of starting new in their craft and they're still trying to build up their abilities. Now, from a from an inspection perspective, yes, inspecting welds to make sure that even if it's an ugly weld, it's a strong weld or it's done properly, I think is critically important. I do not know what that process is because I didn't film it. I didn't even think of asking to film that process. I filmed a couple welds there, but I didn't ask about their, their whole inspection process and I can't comment on that. But again, I know we're looking at the same thing because this is more of like a podcast type video, but the reality behind my trip up to Indiana was to center around knowing that I'm dealing with a major corporation that has stakeholders, that has a lot of employees, a lot of contracts and a lot of responsibility to you, the consumer, to the RV manufacturers that they work with, as well as just in general to the RVing community, I, I, you know, I was very, very aware that questions would be answered in a way that were safe. I was aware of that because, again, if I pressed for answers that were so provocative, so hard, and possibly 
answers that could get someone in trouble in such a way that could impact a lot of money and a lot of jobs, I never would have been invited there. I never would have had the opportunity to at least sit down with them and ask the questions that I asked, which again, were the questions you all wanted me to ask. It doesn't seem as if any of the questions you guys had a problem with. It seemed as if the answers are the ones that you had a problem with. And the reality here is even if I wanted to press them, I never would have gotten the answer you're looking for. Only because, again, they're very careful about how they answer, just as you would be as well if you're a welder on my channel or you're a welder and you're watching my channel and you're like, you know what, I've always done perfect work. I've never, even when I was an apprentice or whatever you call it and, and I was welding, second day I was welding, I was doing the best welds in the world. Well, what if you were working for a job and your weld came under question or scrutiny or the product you made came under question or scrutiny? Or maybe you bought, you own a restaurant and you cook food and the food that you made got somebody sick and they're sitting down with you and somebody's inter the news comes by and they're interviewing you and they're like, okay, so we've had three of your customers claim they've had salmonella poisoning. They're in the hospital right now. Uh, is it the food you cooked for them? What did you do? How did you get salmonella in their food? What did you do to cause them to go to the hospital sick? Now they have tens of thousands of dollars of medical bills. Are you going to pay for it? Are you going to be the one that fixes this for them? You would probably take a very, very um, protected and careful approach to how you answer those questions because you could, you could lose a lot. And these are one of, those, one of those scenarios where I knew who I was interviewing I like the company, believe it or not. I don't think they're a bad company. I saw a lot of cool things. And depending on when you see this video, you're going to see a lot of cool things. And in many cases, they're going to be things that you're like, wow, I couldn't believe Lippard's doing that. I don't believe Lippard's actually building that or offering that. It shows that they're trying to improve the industry. At the same time, we also have to understand what they're going to be protected about and what they're going to try to be safe about because they are a major corporation. And just the fact that they even allowed me to step into that studio to film them, for me, was a pretty good thing. I mean, honestly, regardless of what you think about the answers to the questions that you guys submitted, I picked, honestly, the questions that I knew I would at least get uh, some type of a good answer back with. I did not pick questions that right off the bat were going to be like pointing fingers and saying, what are you doing about this brand who is having this one problem that, again, irresponsible. They're not going to answer it. They're going to be like, why would we answer it? There's half speculation, half conspiracy theory baked into that question. Not enough facts to truly know. Why would we want you to ask us that question and us risk big issues when, when there's no simple answer to it? And I get that. I totally get that. Again, I do feel that the answers in many cases were pretty soft answers, but I do feel like they provided a lot of knowledge. I truly do. I think that we understood something a little different. And one of the things that I want to talk about real quick before we wrap up this incredibly long video is, you know, when we talked about frame detachment and we talk about issues happening to an RV, I want to give you a similar industry that you guys can probably relate to, maybe more than RVs, if you don't have an RV, if you have a pickup truck, because this is certainly something that I've had to deal with, and I think some of you probably have had to deal with as well. So let's say you have RV frame flex. Let's say that you don't believe you've done anything wrong to your RV, nothing. It just has happened out of, maybe you use it a lot, right? And it's happening and you want, maybe it's still within warranty, but you want the manufacturer to just step up and fix it. Well, I have a very similar scenario that's actually happened with every Super Duty I've owned, including the current truck I have. Some of you all probably already are, are knowing, if you own a Super Duty, what I'm about to talk about, that dives in deeper into what manufacturers look for versus just repairing or replacing it, which you might think is easier. So again, we have RV frame flags. We have all these problems going on. I just want someone to own up to it fix the RV because it's stupid expensive to fix it myself. I want the insurance to pay for it, or I want the manufacturer to pay for it, or I want the frame manufacturer. I want someone to take care of it for me. I don't want to foot the bill, and I want it done immediately. Well, again, there's something with pickup trucks that if you're a Super Duty owner, you may be currently experiencing, and if you've went through this, because I've gone through it three times now, you know the pain, and you know, even with trucks, you deal with this problem. So again, we have the problem 
Um, they want to, of course, inspect it. They want to tear things apart. They want to try to see if it was a consumer that damaged it, right? They want to know if you're the reason, if it's water damage, if it's sidewall damage, if it's roof damage that let water get in, if it's rust because you're not taking care of it, all these things, right? They want, they want to know this stuff, and it frustrates owners because it's like they're just passing the ball onto someone else and it's taking forever. Meanwhile, I can't tow my RV. Meanwhile, I have more and more problems. Meanwhile, it's dangerous. I can't stay in this RV park for too long because this is a safety issue and I need to get this fixed, right? And that if, if that's similar to what some of you are probably feeling when you think of this, then let me give you again, kind of an interesting comparison to think about. And that's this right here. So on every Super Duty I've owned, sorry, I got the kids playing right now in the background, but on every Super Duty that I've owned, I've had to have one of my mirrors replaced because it stopped working properly. It would get stuck going out or folding in or going out. It would rattle when it comes out. And I'm even dealing with one of my mirrors doing it now again on this truck. So the driver mirror has been replaced. I'm sorry, the passenger mirror on this truck has been replaced under warranty. This mirror hasn't. So the first problem I had was with my 2011 F250, which also had the telescoping folding mirrors, and the mirror just stopped working. I made a video on it where it was clanky, it was it was jerky, and then it just finally stopped folding in or out, which was really, really frustrating. It was out of warranty, took it to the dealership, and I told the dealership what was going on, and they looked at it, and they said, uh, this mirror is going to be $1,600 to replace just one. And believe it or not, the other mirror was starting to have that issue. And I said, well, what do we do? I don't have a aftermarket warranty. I was actually right around the point where I was going to trade it in for a new truck anyways. They said, well, there's not much you can do. You might be able to find a used one. You might be able to find like a wholesale one through some other dealership. And fortunately I did. I found a company that sold me one for like $750 and I replaced the, the passenger side mirror with the new mirror because they wouldn't cover it. Um, so, okay, so I replaced one. Next truck was my white F450. Now, my white F450 had the exact same problem happen on the passenger side again. The mirror stopped functioning. It wouldn't fold in, wouldn't fold out. Um, it just got real jerky, and it was just really bad. And I know a lot of Super Duty owners know exactly what I'm talking about because they've dealt with this themselves. Now, that truck was under warranty, right? And this is where it got really frustrating. So I've never done anything to that truck, like bad. That truck never got into an accident, never hit anything. But when I brought it to the dealership, they said even under warranty that the technician at the dealership needs to take several pictures of the outside of the mirror to look for any type of physical damage. Any type of physical damage. If there was a scrape, they said Ford won't cover it. And we went to the driver's side as reference and there was a little scrape on the edge right here where I had hit a tree branch that was hanging low on a, on a trail that I was going down and it just left a small little groove right there. He goes, if this mirror goes out, you will not be able to get this one replaced under warranty. You'll have to pay for it. Not even kidding you. They would not cover it because it had that. And that mirror didn't go out, thankfully, but on the passenger side, it didn't show any type of abuse and they covered it under warranty after sending like six pictures to Ford. It was like three months later they found one and they finally covered it under warranty to replace that one mirror on the other side. A $1,600 mirror that was doing something that's very well known, documented by Ford owners. It just starts messing up on its own. And they wanted multiple pictures and proof that it never had any type of physical damage to it whatsoever. This truck passenger mirror. I don't know what it is with the passenger mirror. Actually, I'm sorry. Again, I got to remember. I think my driver mirror on this one is doing the same thing. And it's it's it goes like this whenever I'm trying to push it out. It does fold in and out fine, but it's doing this number when I go in and out. And, and I know what's going to happen next. It's going to stop functioning. And the dealership said, until it's failed completely, we can't, we can't do anything. But there can't be any, they told me there can't be any marks on it at all showing that it's ever made contact with anything because we have to take all these pictures, submit it to Ford, and if there are any kind of signs of damage whatsoever, even a small scratch, they're going to deny the claim. And you got to buy the mirror yourself, $1,600. So I just want you to think about that when we think that this is only impacting the RV industry. Because this happens with almost any industry where something really expensive could happen. They want to make sure, cover themselves and say, well, you damaged it. It was your fault. 
Um, the, the difference I see oftentimes with the RV industry is eventually somebody's willing to, to follow up and do something about it. Somebody will eventually, after enough complaining, enough screaming, enough social media publishing, will do something about it. I've never seen that happen in the automotive industry. I haven't. I've never seen where I can make some call to some VP, make a big enough stink about it, and they're just going to say, well, we're going to cover it for you. I personally have never experienced that. Everything that goes on with my truck, um, I've had to very, very carefully you know, understand what I can do and what I can't do, what they're willing to cover, what they're not willing to cover. Even the drive shaft. If my drive shaft that I talked to you about recently in a video where it had to be recalled because it could get out of balance and fracture, right? Go back and watch that video if you didn't see it. Well, even in that video, what I didn't tell you is if there were any signs that that drive shaft had made contact with any low or high clearance object where, where I hit it on anything, or if it looks as if it was damaged, it would void the whole process of getting it recalled because it shows that it's physical damage and it wasn't because of something they did. It even says on the drive shaft, if this is dropped, you have to discard it. You have to throw it away. So... There's a lot of ways companies try to protect themselves, and I can honestly tell you, as much as, as you may despise the RV industry for their practices when it comes to helping customers, or sorry, it's not even that, I think. I think most people know RV manufacturers, after enough pressure, will try to step up and help you. Most of them will. Most of the companies, right now, a lot of people are being silent, or companies are being silent, but the reality is, I think a lot of them are actually willing to step up if you apply pressure strong enough, and you're seeing that with a lot of these folks that are dealing with this frame flex issue. But at the end of the day, it still comes down to them trying to be sure it's something that they're willing to step up to fix, if that makes sense. The automotive side, you typically don't see that unless a dealership just wants to step up to help you. You know, unless the specific dealership you're working with isn't so busy that they and they care and they want to help you and they're willing to go out of their way to make the right, you know, calls and the right resources to try to fix something for you. And even then, it can be really challenging. Anyways, guys, I sure hope this clears some things up. Um, I don't want folks that watch my channel to be discouraged and to feel as if I'm some type of a pawn in the industry. I try to be really honest about how I feel about things. I'm not kidding you. Um, it doesn't make me popular with the RV industry, believe it or not. There's a lot of RV manufacturers. There's a lot of equipment manufacturers that would never deal with me, never call me, just because when I walk around RVs and I do these reviews and I say, I wish they would have done that better, that's enough for them to think that they're not going to be selling those units because of that, that they'll never work with me. They'd never call me. They'd never say, hey, can you review my unit? We have a new floor plan out. We're, we're featuring this. And... You know, that's kind of sad as well, because I try to focus in on making the RV lifestyle better for everybody. I truly do. I try to to make content that is unbiased. As much as you might think it's pointed just at making the consumer look bad and making the RVs look great and the manufacturers look great, that's not true. Go back and watch my videos and you'll see that I'm equally critical. I basically say it could be the manufacturer, it could be the consumer, but just think about this thing before you just assume it's one or the other. That's all it is. It's it's attempting to be neutral, fair, unbal or fair and balanced. And I think people oftentimes jump on the fact that if you're not instantly jumping on big business or the big companies and you are making a consumer feel as if you're leaving them out to dry, then you're a bad person. And I'm not trying to do that. I try to make every video that I produce focused around as much factual information as I can put in there. And if I don't know the facts, I'll let you know I don't know the facts, but this is my theory or my opinion. And I hope that I relay that well. Anyways, guys, I sure hope you enjoyed this video. This is a long one. I don't make videos this long, so this is more of a podcast. If you've hung through to the very end, thank you so much. I appreciate all of my subscribers. I appreciate all the viewers. Even if you don't subscribe, I'd love for you to. And I appreciate the comments, even the ones that are super critical and negative against me. And I don't, I don't get rid of them unless they're ugly negative. If they're ugly, rude, loaded with cuss words, loaded with vile things that you would never say in front of your children, then that gets kicked out instantly. I don't put up with that. Um, sometimes it takes a while to post some of those comments because they get flagged because sometimes words you say or people put links in, in comments and I don't, I don't allow links because I don't want anybody to ever be directed to a site that's going to spam them or going to you know fish for more information and do things that are, are wrong. Um, but that's the reason why if you put a comment with a link, your comment's not going to go through. I have to go through and review it. If you cuss, it's going to get reviewed. If you say things super vile, ugly, and mean, 
it will probably still get posted as long as it's not that bad, if that makes sense. Anyways, again, God bless you all. I wish you the best. If you're dealing with this problem, um, let me know. You know, send me an email. I'd love to know. If you're dealing with this problem, you want to get interviewed about it, you want to try to get your, your stuff on my channel, as long as we're being neutral, fair, and balanced about it, I, you know, I, I don't see why there's any reason why I wouldn't put it, um, unless I just don't have the capability to for some other reason. And that other reason could simply be um, off filming somewhere, or I'm already filming or working with five or six people on it, and I just haven't had time to get to every email, because I get hundreds of emails each week may not realize that I get hundreds of emails and thousands of comments, and it's hard going through all of those, to be honest. Anyways, again, God bless you. Uh, please take a moment. If you haven't had a chance, subscribe to the channel, give me a thumbs up, and I'll be back to talk to you again.